Good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, April 11th, 2022 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. The meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Uh, tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board has asked anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the, in the basket that's over there on the table to my right. All right, we are going to start our meeting as we always do with a flag salute. I'd like to welcome Fairmount School and Principal Nefratos. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much for having us. We are going to start off with the most important people here with us this evening, the students and our student council sponsors. So come on up. Hi everyone, thank you guys for having us to talk a little bit about student council today. My name is Karen Kroll, I'm a first grade teacher at Fairmount and I'm also a student council co-sponsor. Hi, my name is Jennifer Glynn, I am the social worker at Fairmount and also a co-sponsor of student council. And then these are some of our exec board members, do you guys want to come up and you can say your name and then your um, I'm Abby Stapleton and I am the president of student council. I am Kaleo Davis, and I am the Vice President of Student Council. And I am Mason Fuller, the Treasurer of Fairmount. Our Secretary couldn't be here today. His name is Mac Birch. He wasn't able to attend, so we are really happy to have some of our exec members here with us to talk with you guys all today. Um, they're going to go through and talk about things that we have done already this year for Student Council, and then things that we're looking forward to do in the remainder of the year. One thing that we have done is we've done the Giving Tree, which has benefited Metropolitan Family Services. Uh, this foundation gives to those who are actively fleeing from a domestic violence situation. Fairmont students and staff donated over 500 new winter gear um, for the colder winter months, including hats, gloves, scarves, and socks. Um, so Fairmount students organized a spirit week and fundraising activity that connected to the book Nims Island, which was our one school, one book for this year. We raised $300 plus for Team Seas, which is this program where every dollar you donate is one pound of trash removed from the ocean. And we, next we did the spring Fairmount Student Council will organize a penny wars to believe the, I mean to benefit the fish pantry of Downers Grove. The drive is always a successful fundraiser for us and all the students of Fairmount Elementary love to get involved. The money collected from the fundraiser will go to the fish pantry to help families who need assistance with paying bills or toward supplies and food. That is it for us. A little quick presentation for you guys. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we've had a great time this year raising money and doing things for the community, and we're looking forward to continuing for the rest of the year. Thank, Thank you again you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And now I have the privilege of introducing Dominic Sucaro, our PTA president, who is here with us as well. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, board, for allowing us to speak here today. Uh, so one thing that's been really nice this year so far is it's a little bit back to normal from a PTA standpoint. Um, we've been able to do a lot of more in-person events this year. Uh, like during Halloween, we had our trunk or treat uh, event uh, in the Fairmount parking lot. The classroom parties uh, were a big hit for the kids, obviously, for Halloween and Christmas as well. Uh, fun lunch uh, is back uh, a couple of Fridays. Uh, in the months we have the home run in pizza that delivers the fun lunch, uh, so that's something that's really fun. Uh, our art appreciation program, which is a really good program, is also coming back uh, real soon uh, in the coming weeks. 
Uh, so it's really nice to start seeing a lot of this in-person stuff back uh, with, with the PTA. So it's my second year as a PTA president. The first year was during COVID. And mm. I didn't do much. <laughs> there wasn't much to do. So this is actually kind of exciting to uh, start seeing a lot of these programs. Uh, like our student council had mentioned, we had our one school, one book, uh, which was NIMS Island, uh, which was a great success uh, as well. Uh, some upcoming events that we have, uh, one event that is still going to be virtual this year is our family STEM night, uh, which is coming up on April 28th, but it's a well-attended event and we're really excited about that. Uh, we are going to have a field day uh, at the end of the school year as well, so uh, we're excited about that and hope, hopefully all the kids will have a lot of fun. Uh, the one big thing coming up on uh, Saturday, April 23rd, is our one major fundraiser every year is our trivia night. And we're going to be holding that in person. Um, this will be like the first time in over two years that we get to do the trivia night. So hopefully we'll raise a lot of great funds uh, for the PTA uh, during that night. Um, and just looking forward towards the end of the year, uh, much like we've done in the years past, uh, with all these funds that we do raise, one of our favorite things is our teacher grant program, uh, where we offer the teachers an opportunity to receive funds uh, for classroom enhancements and things along those lines. Uh, in past years, the funds have helped the classrooms with um, like sensory areas and math workstations uh, and mindfulness kits uh, and a lot of sporting equipment for, the, the, for gym class and stuff like that. So really excited about that. And we have a nice, strong volunteer base uh, for the PTA and I believe we're in pretty good shape and we're looking forward to maybe even opening up a little bit more next year with maybe assemblies again and field trips. So we're really excited about this year and looking forward to what's going to be coming up next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dominic, for being here. And so we have had the privilege, obviously, of having two staff members and three students with us this evening. But my hope is in the next video that you're about to view, we will not only be highlighting um, the incredible work of five committees, both staff and student-led at Fairmount, but also bring a few more staff members and students into the boardroom with you this evening. Fairmount currently has five committees within the school. Four of these committees, our HA Committee or Happiness Advantage, our Instructional Leadership Team, Student Focus Committee, and Building Leadership Team are teams of staff members that collaborate regularly in support of the district's strategic plan as well as Fairmount's school improvement plan. Our fifth committee is our Student Advisory Committee that currently consists of nine sixth grade student members who have been on the student-led committee since it was established during the 2020-2021 school year. Our HA, or Happiness Advantage Committee members, have collaboratively supported our school improvement goal encompassing not only positive psychology, but a school culture and climate that strives to put happiness first while supporting genuine staff and student recognitions. Over the summer, we were able to attend the Orange Frog Training, which helped us learn all about positive psychology and how it can impact us as teachers and in our everyday lives. We have really loved taking what we learned and bringing it back to staff members in the district. Our focus has really been to changing our mindsets and looking for the good in things. We've had the opportunity to present at staff to staff members at meetings about what we've learned in our training and throughout the Happiness Advantage book. We try to make a conscious effort to share more positive thoughts throughout our day at school and at home as well. And at the beginning of the school year, we had students um, come in and surprise the staff with what we call a joy bomb, where they were singing and dancing and of course passing out some candy, just passing up, spreading a lot of happiness and putting smiles on teachers' faces. Every student in the school also got to choose something that makes them happy and added a picture of that to the bulletin board that you see when you come into our building every day. Um, and it, you know, it just serves as a great reminder of everything that makes all of us happy each day. We're really grateful for this opportunity and we cannot wait to continue talking about happiness in the years to come. The Thermal Instructional Leadership Team met several times prior to the start of and early in the school year to review data and assess areas of strength and areas of potential growth within our school. Our ILT team reviewed NWA map and standards-based grades distribution data. Throughout this process, vocabulary and word analysis knowledge, application, and utilization were identified as a goal target. 
In review of various research-based articles and texts in conjunction with a root cause analysis, Fairmont's ILT committee identified the need to further develop vocabulary building wide. This year, members of the instructional leadership team decided to focus on read aloud and put tier two vocabulary words at the forefront of our instruction across all grade levels and subject areas. Throughout the school year, the ILT team facilitated collaborative staff groups to not only support their knowledge of tier two vocabulary, but to also incorporate those words across instructional opportunities. In its fifth year of work at Fairmount, our Student Focus Committee has continued to foster opportunities to support students both in and out of the classroom with targeted Falcon focuses. Additionally, the committee worked collaboratively to reimagine aspects of the student recognition component which was successfully implemented this school year. Fairmount Student Focus Committee supports opportunities for the entire staff to recognize and celebrate positive student behaviors. This year, the committee identified five main areas to focus on. We kicked off the school year with teamwork and are currently celebrating examples of student preparedness. Theme-based bulletin boards were used throughout the year to showcase students that demonstrated the targeted behaviors. The Student Focus Committee has had an easy task due to the fact that Fairmount is represented by a remarkable group of students that demonstrate positive behaviors on a daily basis. The building leadership team was instrumental this year in collaborating on various aspects of this unique school year. As students and staff return to a more typical school year, BLT brainstormed many ways to better support student transitions, schedule adjustments, and even our most recent transition to a normalized lunch system. This collaborative team is already working on plans for the 2022-23 school year. Looking ahead to next school year, BLT is currently brainstorming ideas to develop a school-wide system to further support positive behaviors in and out of the classroom. Just a little over a year ago, Fairmount School presented information at a December board meeting on the establishment of a student advisory committee. Our student members have demonstrated leadership and positivity in continuing to share their insight with the principal at our regular meetings. We are currently on the Student Advisory Committee and we meet monthly with Ms. Neferatis to collaborate with our teammates and come up with new ideas for our school. One of our responsibilities before the end of the year is to recruit incoming 5th uh, and 6th graders to the Student Advisory Committee. As part of the Student Advisory Committee, we work with Ms. Neferatis to help change our school. For instance, towards the beginning of the year, we help to reinstate student announcements with the 6th graders, which has helped our school feel a little bit more normalcy in these times. Now, towards the end of the year, our, us students are working to recognize our teachers and staff using positive office referrals as they have often done in the past to us students, which I think is a great way to show how much we appreciate all the hard work they put into our education. While our current 6th grade student advisors begin their work recruiting incoming 5th and 6th graders for this important committee, I couldn't resist the opportunity to talk with a few future student advisors. We're in kindergarten now. We can be on the committee in five years. <laughs> Two, three, four, five. When I am a committee with Ms. Royce and I'm older, I would love it because I can be famous. <laughs> I, I, when I'm older, I want to be on a committee with Miss Neferatus because I really like her. <laughs> is that a good word? Yeah. What, <laughs> what is an idea? <laughs> idea is like something, who, someone who comes up with something. If I was on the committee, I would like to share all of my ideas. It's important that Mrs. Mufalardos listens to students. We students have a lot of awesome ideas. We could that we could decorate the class. We could decorate the whole school with Christmas ornaments. When I'm in the committee with Miss. And if we're honest, when I get older, I'm going to make a super big fence so no fan out people can kick the ball really high up. <laughs> <laughs> My idea is to take Fairmount Elementary.
elementary school yellow. My idea is to paint Fairmont Elementary School blue. My idea is to paint Fairmont, Fairmont Elementary School rainbow. I would love to be on the committee to share my ideas. So hopefully that gave you a taste of not only the work that the incredible staff and students have been doing, um, but what we have and are looking forward to in the future. And I would argue, Kevin Bardo, I think you have a few facility planners in the making, <laughs> in addition to student advisors at um, um, Fairmount as well. But thank you again for having us this evening and for the work you do for our students. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay, listed on tonight's agenda are 13 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications uh, anyone would like to share at this time? Okay. And uh, we have no spotlight today, so we're going to go straight to the superintendent's report. Great. I'm the lucky person who gets to follow that presentation, so here we go. Um, well, as they're, they're walking out, I just want to say on behalf of the Board of Education and staff of District 58, uh, thank you to the Fairmount students, staff, and families for a wonderful presentation, especially the end there. That was great to hear the kids, and uh, I hope that gives you a flavor of just how normal uh, things are starting to get in our uh, schools, and a lot of fun. Just a quick update in terms of curricular instruction for the IAR. Uh, we are entering the second week of the District 58 testing window for the IAR assessment. As of today, we're seeing a greater than 99% participation rate across the district, which is important uh, when we talk about really trying to capture how our students are performing. We know in the past with the park exam, we've had uh, some difficulty with uh, full participation. So I want to commend uh, the entire teaching and learning team for really emphasizing that in our building principles. Uh, field trips. I'm very happy and thrilled to share that all students in grades 1 through 6 will have the opportunity to experience a field trip before the end of the year. And of course our middle schoolers will also be able to experience their typical end of the year uh, celebrations. So these are trips that align with our science curriculum and were missed opportunities for the past two school years due to the pandemic. We focus on the two trips that are primarily outdoor experiences and also closest to us to minimize uh, travel time on buses. Students in grades four through six will take a trip to the Morton Arboretum. The sixth grade students will have a unique program that includes an additional self-guided portion that will allow for additional activities, recognizing that these students did not have their typical outdoor education uh, experience. We'll continue to investigate outdoor education opportunities for next year's sixth grade students as more and more opportunities become available. Students in grades one through three will experience Wonder Woods, a program at Lyman Woods that was completely redesigned for District 58 first graders and intended to debut in the spring of 2020. Sending all of our students in grades one through three ensures that all District 58 students will have an opportunity to experience Lyman Woods, a local point of pride uh, for Downers Grove. We appreciate this educational partnership as always with the Downers Grove Park District. We're also, or excuse me, we also appreciate the support of the Pierce Downer Heritage Alliance. This group has traditionally supported the Lyman Woods experience for our students by presenting a donation to offset the field trip costs. Tonight, we welcome Mr. Ken Lerner from the Pierce Downer Heritage Alliance to present a donation this year. The donation is $1,500, which is three times their typical annual donation. And so Mr. Lerner, on behalf of the board, we'd like to welcome you and thank you for all your hard work uh, for the Pierce Downer Heritage Alliance. Hi, and thank you. The, uh, uh, so yeah, I'm Ken Lerner. I'm here on behalf of Pierce Downers Heritage Alliance. We're a local uh, group promoting uh, environmental and historic preservation. Uh, we have a very local focus to Downers Grove. And uh, as uh, Dr. Russell mentioned, we have been supporting uh, outdoor education uh, using Lyman Woods and uh, District 58 for, for some time. And uh, we were happy to support the, uh, the Little Sprouts program for many years. And uh, of course, that all came to a screeching halt uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, but they, uh, they put the time in the, in the intervening uh, couple of years to good use, revamping the program, uh, as he mentioned. And uh, um, the uh, uh, 
curriculum staff and uh, worked uh, together cooperatively with uh, the Park District staff to redesign the program and expand it uh, to a whole day program from a half day to a whole day, which means that uh, they really can do more once they're there. They can really get some hands-on experience uh, with the uh, displays and uh, activities that they have at the interpretive center, uh, and they can get out into the woods and see some of the different environments that they have there, the hills, the oak forest, uh, wetlands, and, uh, and get a look at some of those things that they couldn't do before with the limited time available. So we're very happy to see the expansion of the program and the fact that it's also been expanded for this year to include first, second, and third graders. So nobody has to miss out on this particular field trip uh, because they're part of the COVID generation. Uh, so well that expanding the, the program means that there's going to be 34 groups and all coming through. <laughs> it's going to going to cycle through from now till pretty much the end of the school year, I think. And uh, you know, so everybody will get a chance to get out there and uh, and see Lyman Woods, which is uh, this uh, really wonderful natural resource that we're lucky to have here, right here in Douglas Grove. So it's uh, it's good to take advantage of it, and uh, and so we. Uh, like to express our appreciation and our support for environmental education in a tangible way uh, with a check donation to help offset some of the costs. We can't do it all, but we can try and help a little bit. <laughs> I love taking checks. So that's <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lerner. We really appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Thank you. And just another great example of our community. For the next update my report, I want to mention uh, just briefly technology. I want to thank Dr. Ike Miller and his team. Uh, IR testing, which is all computerized now, has been going off without a hitch. We did have our one of our internet providers. Their uh, signal went down last week, uh, but James and his team were able to shift it to our alternate um, configuration and did a great job and our students didn't miss a beat. So I know that's been something we've really focused on the last few years and it's paying huge dividends. So thank you for your hard work with that. In terms of student services, uh, we want to talk to you about a Safe to Help program that we're very proud to launch in District 58. I especially want to thank Jessica Stewart and her team for making this a uh, reality. As part of its School Safety Awareness Initiative this past October, the Illinois State Board of Education launched Safe to Help. This is a resource available to all students 24-7 at no cost to school districts that provides multiple confidential pathways for students, families, and staff to proactively report potential mental health and safety concerns. So again, we're very, very proud to uh, jump on board in what I think our community is really going to benefit from. District 99 utilizes the exact same uh, resource. And so even though we're not a unit district, the more things we can do K through 12 for our families, I think is extremely uh, beneficial. Uh, with the mental health crisis that's going on in society right now, having confidential pathways to report these kinds of things is extremely important. And uh, I want to really thank our team because whenever you have an initiative in the middle of the school year, some people may say, well, we'll, we'll start that next year. And, and our team felt, no, this is very important. We need to get this up and running. And they went ahead and did that. All of our principals and our uh, support team will have this in their email signature as well, so families have access to it. And uh, we're very, very proud of uh, this program and to start it off, so thank you. I also would like to thank uh, Roadrunners, which is the local soccer organization that partnered with the Education Foundation and the Rotary Club for um, the Grove Express this year. Roadrunners dedicated uh, $12,500 of their funds back to District 58. They asked specifically that it goes for special education. Jessica Stewart and the DLP team worked very closely and they identified a program. Uh, again, uh, students in the DLP uh, participate in direct instruction on daily living skills, which include uh, pre-vocational skills, self-care and hygiene practice, among other areas. This donation will specifically fund improvements to the program's daily living skills instruction by providing for appliance updates, improved organizational systems, and more privacy options. Many of the daily living tools that current DLP students practice using, such as washing machine and dryer, are more than 20 years old and in poor condition, and so we really appreciated this uh, donation. And again, I think it just really shows these strong community partnerships. So thank you to Don Renner and the Road, or excuse me, Road Runners uh, for all their help. We really appreciate uh, not only the partnership here, but also with the Grove Express. 
In terms of finance, later on, uh, Todd Rayfall will give an overview of the five-year financial plan uh, that we will have a special meeting about a little later this month that the board will get an overview of that. In terms of facilities, I, I uh, want to be careful what I'm about to say, but I believe we're nearing the end of snow season. Uh, and so uh, being here in the Village Hall, I also want to thank our community partners, the Village, who really assist us throughout the entire process of snow removal. I also want to thank our, our maintenance team who are out there all the time uh, working through, uh, sometimes late in the evenings, on weekends. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I'm not guaranteeing that it's not going to snow again, but I do believe we're starting to get to that point in the year. So uh, again, Kevin, uh, thank you to you and your team. In terms of community relations, later on in the agenda, the board will be asked once again to approve the latest update to the district's COVID-19 mitigation plan. In accordance with the CDC guidance, school districts should remove mitigation measures with a layered approach. To that end, as shared at the last board meeting, the district has moved back to normal lunch procedures at the elementary schools. It's important to note that the middle schools have been operating in this manner for the entire school year with much success. And uh, the, this update to our procedures is in line with neighboring districts and things are going very smoothly. So I wanna thank our principals. Um, it's a lot of work to transition the elementary kids back to normal lunch. Just think about all the routines associated with that. So I know Lisa is still here in the audience. Uh, so Lisa, thank you for all your hard work. It's gone very well. And to tell you that the kids are excited to be back in normal lunch uh, would be the understatement of the year. I know my elementary students at, at my house are back to normal lunch and they are still talking about uh, how great it is. And I, again, it's just that one step toward uh, normalcy. In terms of personnel, I want to thank our parents for completing the registration process. We're not 100% done, but we are getting closer and closer. It's very helpful for us that parents fill that out as soon as possible so we can finalize uh, our staffing for next school year. I know uh, Jane Uzentis is working very, very hard on that. Uh, the hiring process is underway. We're beginning to rehire those staff members who were impacted by the reduction in force in March, which is fantastic. We've also begun interviewing candidates for newly available positions. Additionally, we are in the interview uh, process for our two principal openings uh, at Henry Puffer and Kingsley, and we hope to have two candidates to the board either at the special meeting later this month or at the latest in May. So things are moving along very well, and compliments to Jane and her team for all that they're doing. Uh, that concludes the superintendent's report. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Russell. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Dreyfall, uh, time for the monthly business and treasures report. Check and see if there's anyone left. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> start with the year to date report. Uh, mm -hmm. Things are, are moving um, as is, as, as they normally would. Uh, you can see that we're in line the one area we talked about uh, at the uh, FAC meeting on Friday morning was purchase service in the operations and maintenance uh, I don't think it's a <coughs> mystery that you know we've we've had a unusually harder winter than previously and that along with the snow removal along with a number of costly uh, repair uh, projects that we had um, this year have kind of have pushed that purchase service uh, line up we're going to go through and make sure that there isn't something that isn't you know a capital piece that needs to be moved down to capital but uh you know those are the things that uh, sometimes hit up against the budget uh, overall though we you know for the for the fund and, and and for budget wise we should be coming in um below where we expected in fact when you will see the projection in the in the financial plan in a minute and we do a readjustment a bit for fiscal year 22 where we now know we have some additional revenue coming in uh, and some and some savings and expenditures in other areas that we've adjusted so but overall uh, year to date we're in good position um, comparative to where we are budget and comparative to previous years we'll uh, we'll get to the financial plan in just a second we have a few other items on uh, on the act first I'm sorry questions on the year-to-date report We have a few items uh, for the board for this evening. Uh, this is the third year in a row for the Rexnard abatement. Um, the Rexnard Aerospace uh, Company has a, uh, a facility here. They manufacture aerospace parts, and I'm not sure which kind, but uh, something with that. Uh, in 2017, the district uh, board, along with District 99, approved an abatement 
for that piece, for that facility, uh, and this is the third year uh, as part of that piece that uh, in meeting that requirement. Additionally, there are um, as an acceptance of an anonymous donation um, for a uh, basketball set up at, at Pierce Downer with the additions of Pierce Downer over time that has adjusted the property that it doesn't have the end-to-end -end basketball structure like most many of our other schools do um, an individual in the community has stepped forward and uh, said he uh, that person would like to donate but would like to remain anonymous uh, so you have on the uh, on this doc on this uh, meeting the donation as well as the bid uh, to do the work and that'll be done this summer along with um, bids for their miscellaneous painting for the summer work um, for the for the district and if there are any questions on that um, we can then move to the financial plan any other questions okay Okay, so for the financial plan, uh, Todd and I are going to piggyback off a presentation. First thing you notice, you can see the difference between a CSBO and a school superintendent. Uh, the financial plan is listed in fiscal years 23 through 27, but most of us talk in terms of school year, so that's school years 22, 23 through school year 26, uh, 27. I know we're always trying to figure out, are we in the fiscal year or the school year? So we wanted to clearly indicate that. Um, the opening slide here, we are in, in better and better shape as a school district financially. And, and I think we really need to highlight the work that is taking place in the district. By no means does that mean that all the financial issues in District 58 are solved, but why are we in better shape? What are we doing? And, and really, I truly believe it's because all groups associated with the Board of Education, whether that's the FAC, the Strategic Planning Committee, the Superintendent's Community Advisory Council, we're all prioritizing fiscal responsibility, transparency, and a strong stewardship of taxpayer dollars. We continue to embrace these things, and they really are helping us move forward. And again, I want to highlight the importance of strategic planning. When you spell something out as a community, it's a great guiding light for the school district. I do believe we're headed in the right direction, and we are going to continue to embrace that planning process. We're going to continue to make um, what I call very responsible financial decisions. That doesn't mean that they're always the most popular decisions, um, but we do have to live within our means as a school district, and that means making some challenging decisions, which I want to commend this board and the, and the previous boards for, for doing that, because uh, that's not always easy. We are going to continue to seek community input, and, and not just have sessions where we provide overviews, but really seek that genuine two-way dialogue. I think the Financial Advisory Committee is a great example of that. The Superintendent's Community Advisory Council and the District 58 Citizen Task Force are great examples of that. Um, finally, we're going to continue to always prioritize the needs of our students and staff. So the five-year financial plan that you're seeing is a student-centered approach to what we feel is best for kids. So I'll turn it over to Todd. When we started to develop the, when we, when we had finished uh, the financial plan process, we realized we had to kind of go back and, and and talk a bit about how we got here uh, because this presentation is is different in how in in some ways from previous presentations uh, of these projections um, just as a reminder uh, for the board and for community uh, this is the second year of a financial plan that we have a formal process where the board approves a plan and then approves the budget um, based off of that plan. The district has for several years um, used a five-year financial planning model uh, and looked at projections, so where we were headed and trending and so forth. But the plan is a more formal process where we, we really kind of have that focus and, 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 and put that into place. What that has helped us do is address and ensure that we aren't doing some of the things that we that the district has has done in the past uh, that caused us to, to have some of the issues uh, where we were looking at having to make adjustments and and having limited resources uh, where we had deficit budgets uh, that we were not having the investment in the capital um, and where we we're to the point where we had and, and we talk, always talk about this where we have a million dollars in the bank on the Friday 
we get the early property tax funds on the Monday, and if we didn't, we were in having to look at warrants or, or borrowing or, or some capacity because we had a $2 million payroll that we had to charge the accounts on that Wednesday, the following Wednesday. So um, we aren't in that position any longer, and we don't anticipate going there again. Um, and, and part of that has been this, this building of this plan, moving from the projection model to the plan process uh, and going forward. And so that putting that into that piece, making sure our budgets are balanced and ensuring that um, we're meeting that fund balance policy of 35%. Uh, to go through it and, and remind that 35% came from figuring out where that low cash point was moving it to a point of what's that percentage at the end of, of expenditures and and what's a simple way of being able to maintain and monitor that uh, to come up with a conservative format and that's where we came up with the, po the policy working with the FAC uh, bringing it to the board and the board adopting it and that is a piece that drives us as a is a important priority item uh, when development of, of the of the plan knowing that we have resources not just for the next fiscal year but for the for the next you know for the foreseeable future um, continually work on best practices for large updates including capital uh, that includes putting those schedules for curriculum updates and, and, and technology updates um, and, and and pieces of that came back through uh, from board input um, and FAC as well but you know uh, I think what our old check pointed out, you know, the technology conversation a couple of years ago when we started talking about the plan and the projection process and how does that work out. So we put those pieces in the plan and how that's going to gonna function. And then continually working with our community of experts. We're very, very fortunate uh, in Downers Grove to have a great number of people who have some strong financial background. And every, you know, cycle when we have new people coming on, um, you know, the conversation about what's it like in business and how's it work in, in government and the differentials, but having that input is extremely helpful um, and has helped us really build um, a better model. Um, and of course, we continually work uh, to find other non-local resources um, for uh, for funding of of, of operations, of, of uh, capital, of other uh, you know anything we can do. I just received an email, I think, uh, a couple of days ago from someone who had sent a presentation uh, from uh, Representative Caston's uh, piece about funds available. And so there's something we'll look to see uh, if there's funds available on a, rev on a, on a federal basis. Uh, usually those flow through the state board. Uh, but if there's something that we can look at in, in that, that frame framework. so And of course, the DCO funds that we have that are helping us with the playgrounds that we'll be working on. <laughs> As with anything, we continue to make sure we utilize it. Start from the street. I always call it mission, vision, and goals. Yeah, yeah. mission, vision, and goals, and a strategic plan. Um, any budget and any plan that we put together has to be based on on that framework because that's our that's our belief system and our structure to ensure um, we're focused on staff and students and on the things that uh, the community has gone through and developed a, a process and, and, and what we're moving forward to. Uh, continually using the experts in the FAC, we've talked about that. Um, the plan that we have put forward in a significant piece, there are, option, there are items in here um, that take advantage of a potential referendum in the sense that if the board move, if there's community support and the board chooses to move into that direction, um, there is some pieces, and we'll talk about them in a minute, as to allow us to do some things that programmatically have been on wish lists for the board for the community for some time, um, and we continually work uh, to utilize uh, facilities and relook at uh, utilization. Obviously. The biggest piece to that has been uh, the sale of Longfellow this last year uh, and 
three million dollars or 2.7 2.8 million dollars of capital work that is happening uh, in the buildings this summer uh, from that sale uh, that are helping deal with building envelope dealing with with health safety issues and things for our buildings uh, to improve them for the community and for our students so what's in the plan first as I talked about we meet, make sure we hit that 35 percent uh, fund balance policy requirement through the plan uh, we also understanding and looking at the capital and, and we're reminded that we're looking at the the potential possible referendum of 178 but the master's facilities plan uh, the board uh, looked at when it was initially developed by the community was over 245 um, there are other things that are not in that referendum a lot of energy savings pieces uh, and so forth that we need to continually look to address uh, in allowing us to be able to to put a million dollars uh, in transfer annually in from operation and unrestricted resources into the capital fund to continually look at and build uh, into that capital piece for those other pieces uh, that are not in you know any potential referendum also in the financial plan is the staffing plan that was presented to the board in March uh, with a variety of new positions uh, added some of those positions are funded by the ESSER 3 which we've talked about um, one of the things we we're in a we're, we're still I, I, I say we're in a bit of a still a COVID economy uh, in the sense of education the first two years we concentrated on operations technology and the updates that we need to do to our facilities to our technology uh, first for remote and then for cleanliness and sanitation uh, to be able to to have school in session now our focus completely though it's been part of this during that time the real shift becomes to learning loss and uh, management of, of student uh, mental health um, social and emotional needs and so with the remaining uh, ESSER funds that we have to be able to spend through fiscal year 23 which would be school year 22 23 uh, and uh, 23 24 um, to allocate those resources for added additional staff uh, to help meet those needs of our student population and that's about eight hundred thousand dollars a year um, also and we we talked about this in previous in the previous month is the continual shift um, in our special ed programs to a least restrictive environment in District 58 schools from private placement facilities or use of uh, our cooperative those are still needed items that we use um, however we have worked and I should say the special department worked uh, extraordinarily well over the last several years to continually work to bring students home um, not only is that what is ideal um, it's required under the law uh, but it is also a reduction of about over three million dollars in the last several years of expenditures or savings um, in in doing so uh, and that too is part of this plan included in the plan is as the board is considering uh, the option of looking at a dual language program uh, that is um, at a conservative level um, an estimate of, of three posi staffing positions over the next five years so we've added one position in 24 25 and 26 as a projection uh, depending on structure and circumstances it could be less um, but that's what we measure the impact right now today of that program uh, so that is included into this uh, there's we have and we'll continue at least for the time being and it may be for for several years one-off revenue and expenditure pieces uh, it really has taken a chip with 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 ESSER and those COVID uh, funds coming in from the federal government uh, but there's some additional pieces coming in 
and this may not be the last one that we have noted in here. Um, uh, we have a grant for $1.4 million um, for the iPad replacement. Those will be coming in this summer. Um, and so that piece is also in there. The other piece that is in there is, and this is, this is the one that's a bit contingent on, on the passage of a referendum in the sense that uh, if we don't have that, we will have to look for capital needs and use of, other, of resources that we have on hand to help really address some of the capital items that we have with the district. Uh, but it removes uh, the $1.3 million in upkeep fees uh, effective for fiscal year 24. Um, essentially ending that format and moving to what we would come, will potentially come to the board, the recommendation for an all-day kindergarten format. Um, and so that has been put into that piece. Um, we also have in there, you know, the capital piece for funding for the DCO grants for the next, um, uh, that we have received from the, from the state. Uh, and as we said, the, the capital funding um, for the summer from the proceeds from Longfellow. So I've been taught always to start with a graph showing a line and tables and so forth <laughs> to help <coughs> instead of a large, large spreadsheet. Um, the important <laughs> piece to note <laughs> is the top line, which is the ending fund balance. Um, because that's the slope that we look at. Is it going down? Is it staying straight? And what is it doing? Um, so that's the important piece. The important piece is showing that we are able to stabilize and hold a fund balance through the plan that is growing or at least keeping even with the expenditures meeting that, that threshold. This is why I can give you the graph before the table. Um, the pieces to focus on uh, in this are, are we ending up, what's our balance, our beginning balance and ending balance, and what is the percentage at the bottom, uh, and are we at 35%? Now we will note that this plan gets to a deficit position where expenditures exceed revenue in fiscal year 27. We always point out that oftentimes that is that that can happen. You know there are assumption upon assumptions over multiple years. Uh, it's our goal always that we do this each year is to make sure that we never reach the point where we're in a position um, that we're having a problem. That's, that's the exercise. But we'll also note that even at the end of that fiscal year 27, we're at 35.12% we're at um, fund balance to expenditure. So we're still within the parameters of 35% fund balance. Um, you have in the piece um, that million dollars, so this is just looking at the operating funds that million dollars transfer from operations into the capital fund to help fund uh, capital expenditures um, on an annual basis, whether it be a roof each year, whether it be accumulation of building a balance and then, you know, a couple of years doing a multi-million dollar project, um, supplementing, adding to, working with energy grants and so forth uh, to do some of those, those other items that are not included in um, you know, in the referendum. So I'm going to pause on this page at this point and see if there are any questions. We have other two other charts that are the revenue expenditures, just to give those for background. Um, but this is the uh, it, this is the point where I think you know, have a conversation or questions about the plan itself and and where we're at with it. Todd, I guess just for the benefit for, for everyone in the room, can you maybe just add some color to that million dollars and, and kind of how that number was arrived at and, and how we had no number established in the past. So this is a, definitely a you know <coughs> good step in the right direction, but how, how did we kind of put um, the pencil to establish that number? There, there's a piece that, it, yeah, there's what can we, what can we put in and keep working on maintain our program structure 
um, maintain our curriculum update format, our technology format refresh, uh, our our support and, and our resource, you know, our, our, our programs as they are, and what are we able to put in each year that is meaningful, that has some some bulk to it. Um, you know, we talk about you know an L, uh, uh, initial projection for one roof. Uh, one year was a, you know about a million two, a million three. Um, some of them are going to be more, depending. On, you know, that we continually work towards getting to that point where we're putting substantial money uh, into a capital fund. The district established a, a sinking fund some time ago that, that's in the operations and maintenance to put money aside. Um, and in all honesty, that fund has not been able to be utilized. We've talked about this over the years because we've needed that fund, those funds on, on hand for paying the bills. Um, we're now to a point where given the way that we've maintained our systems and with the increases in revenue that are coming in, we're able to really start looking at moving that million dollars a year into capital to really start working on some of those, those other larger capital items. I think to, to, to just piggyback off of that, running this by the FAC, we needed to ensure that we weren't in a position like we were in last year where we had to refinance debt in order to pay for a critical infrastructure like the roof of Pierce Downer. And so, you know, for anyone listening at home right now, is a million dollars enough to keep up with all of our facilities? No, it, it, it's not. But we wanted to find that number that annually we could pay for a major repair in, in, in savings and um, not have to sacrifice the educational opportunities for our, our, our children. So the million dollar number came from advisement from the FAC, what does it cost for one of those big repairs annually, and what can we realistically do where we stretch it as far as we possibly can into that capital fund. And, and so that was really the thinking behind uh, the million dollars. Um, again, you, I also want to point out you see things in this plan like potential for full day kindergarten and potential for dual language program. Obviously, those are decisions that have to be discussed and debated with the Board of Education. We wanted to make sure that we still provided that flexibility. If you, if the board uh, determines that a referendum doesn't make sense or if it is not successful, should the board pass that, um, you would have to see this number go up in terms of capital. And we would be recommending instead of funding full day kindergarten to take that money and put that into uh, this number even more. So you'd be looking at two and a half million annually uh, because then you will have multiple things that you'll, you'll need uh, to pay attention to in terms of our facilities. Again, that won't be enough to pay for everything, but, but that is how we can stretch it as far as we can and still pay for some of those major expenses. Any other questions or comments? And really what we would encourage the, the board to do is to take a look at this presentation, take a look at these numbers. We ran these by the FAC. Again, we do have that financial workshop coming up at the end of the month, and, and so we wanted to give you an overview today before you were uh, in a position where you had to vote for it later on in the month. But please, if you'd like to find time with Todd and myself, or Todd, and, and sit down and ask more uh, detailed questions now that you've got a chance to see this overview, uh, please feel free to, uh, to give us a call or, or to set up an appointment. We, we'd be more than happy to walk you through uh, these numbers. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, the policy committee has not met since the last board meeting and neither did the legislative uh, committee. The financial advisory committee did meet last Friday, April 8th, uh, 2022. Though you heard most of our, our conversation, we did do a, a review on the, the staffing a portion of that. We looked at the five-year draft. We did have a lot of conversation on the ESSER funds and how those came in and how they're being applied to positions and what potentially might happen if we find that we still may need a position for a year or two longer um, because obviously remember the idea of investor funds is we're creating something new to solve a problem that happened during covid we hope that they will all be solved in in the time frame that the funding will allow but it might not uh, so we, always, we had some conversations around that uh, the, we had some nice conversations that are, uh, regarding the movement of more special ed programs in our district the advantage that it has to us financially but also really the advantage that it had to bring the students back kind of under our umbrella and there was a lot of um, excitement around that as well uh, I, I 
Greg, I think that you and I were the only, yeah, you, you and I were the only two on, uh, sitting on the board at the time when the Rexnard abatement came in. Uh, initially, we approved that in October of 2017. So every year, even though we are under a contractual agreement with them, because that number shifts every year, we do have to sort of uh, take a formalized vote here that's coming up. We're going from, it, it was set at 20% before, we're going up to 30%. It steps up 10% a year, we're in the third year. And then we had a little bit of a conversation about the donation to the district uh, regarding the playground expansion over at Pierce Downer to include uh, a basketball court there. Um, uh, and, and the other donations that we've had kind of coming uh, through that over the years include, and then some of that DCEO money that kind of comes along with that as well. That was really kind of the, the main bread and butter of what we spoke about. Am I missing anything, Steve? No, no sir. Good, yeah. good summer. And, and kind of in preparation for our meeting in two weeks. Happy to answer any questions on any of those topics or anything else. All right, then that concludes my report. The district leadership team did not meet since the last meeting, and neither did health and wellness. So that brings us to the public comment portion of the evening. This is an opportunity of members of the audience to share public comment with the board. You skipped the discussion Wait. item, Darren. What? You skipped. Mm -hmm. Where did Justin? Right out of discussion. Justin's Where is it? There. That's oh. Not okay. All right, Justin, uh, we're going to have a, our, our discussion <laughs> item for the night is the potential like two-way dual language program. Thank you. A lot of people were getting up to do the public comment. I know. <laughs> See how that could be overwhelming. Lisa, you will have your chance here. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, tonight we're bringing back information um, and, and some answers to questions and some further information around the potential for two-way dual language programming and really taking a closer look at what that program will look like at all levels. So just as some reminders, information that's been shared previously, but there's good background for this conversation. The first is the recognition that we are obligated to provide bilingual instruction to certain students. Now the way that's spelled out in school code is that if we have 20 or more EL eligible students with the same native language in an attendance area, then we need to provide instruction to those students in that native language. If we have fewer than that number, we're not obligated. So for us in District 58, that typically includes two or three of our attendance centers and only includes the language Spanish. We don't have that quantity of any other native language in the district. Since the inception of the dual language, pro language program, we have not limited that Spanish instruction, though, only to the EL Spanish-speaking students from those schools of residence. We have opened the um, program to any EL students student who is eligible, speaks Spanish, and wishes to join that dual language program. So that really is kind of our obligation and where the program began. We currently, again, have what's known as a one-way program, where all of the students that are in that dual language program are native Spanish speakers or Spanish heritage family speakers. There are no monolingual English students as part of that program. Since 2018, the Dual Language Committee has been meeting and researching and observing and talking with, with experts and consultants and really digging into all of this information. And, and honestly, their conclusion was reached long ago and continues to be borne out in each new year of research and conversation that really that two-way dual language program, which again is the structure where we would have a classroom balanced of native Spanish-speaking students and native English-speaking students, that really leads to the strongest outcomes academically. It leads to the strongest and, and most efficient uh, language acquisition for our EL students. And so that, as I said, that research has been relatively conclusive as we've gone forward. The reality is the committee was ready to bring that recommendation to the board a few years ago. And there were a couple of different things that delayed that. Our, our budget projections a few years back delayed the looking at, at virtually any new programming. And then obviously during the pandemic, that wasn't the time to launch new programming or be in new um, organization programs. So while you know, while we've only brought this to the board table recently in, in terms of moving forward with this two-way decision, it really is something that has been a, a topic of discussion for the committee and, a, and a, a recommendation that was ready to be made for many, many years. The other reality is that this year, as you know, we didn't bring students in to a full kindergarten dual language program because we really were committing to taking a look at all of the programming options and reviewing all of that before we made some of those long-term commitments going forward. 
So in February, we brought forward the recommendation of pursuing that two-way program beginning with next year's kindergarten students, and we were asked to bring back more information, particularly in three major areas. One was sustainability. What would, what would the impact of this be, and would it become something where we were, it would prohibit us from other initiatives in the future? We had some questions around how we would select students, and then we had some questions around the potential for a fee-based <coughs> program. And so since that time, the dual language teaching team and the BPAC have had a couple of opportunities, that's the Bilingual Parent Advisory Committee, to review kind of where we're at, what we're working through, and then have some input into these recommendations. Certainly, you know, nothing is, is definite at this point, and we're still welcoming all of that input, but we have had an opportunity to really now dig a little further into, okay, what will this look like, or what could this look like for the next several years? And part of the, the the answer of the question of what will the two-way program look like really also has to include what will the structure for the students who are currently in the program look like for the next eight years that those students would be part of a program we would theoretically be phasing out that one-way program. And so one of the ways we're looking to maximize efficiencies is to bring the whole elementary program under one roof next year. As you may recall, we moved students from Kingsley back to El Sierra for the dual language program a couple years ago. This year, current fifth and sixth graders are in the program at Kingsley. And so our initial plan was to continue for those sixth graders so that they could finish at Kingsley after being there for several years. In individual conversations with those families, the, the reality is that some of them have moved in more recently and some of them would actually prefer to be at El Sierra because that's that's where siblings are now within the program. And so we're, we're looking then at, after consulting those families, moving those sixth graders for their final year back over to El Sierra, which will help with the way we can structure the whole program. So then as we look at the, the organization, it's really based upon instructional considerations, the individual student groups. You know, this year, as you'll recall, we changed the format of the program a little bit at the beginning of the year where we had students not in self-contained dual language programs, but directly into other homerooms. We, we shifted that for our current first graders mid-year just based on the needs of that population. And this has really been one of the conversations around this one-way program that we've had since the beginning of the committee and frankly before the committee was, was around. But you know, as we look to what is the best way to continue to support our students that are in this one-way program where we have five students at one grade level and nine students at another grade level, we've had to, to make some decisions around instructional modeling that are, that are the best we can do reasonably with what that program leaves us with. And that really is part of the conversation around then why look at a two-way program. So and then just as a reminder, our current allocation of staffing for the dual language program is listed there. So looking to next year, potentially kindergarten would be a two-way classroom. That is just so one classroom with one dual language teacher. Our first graders this year, we've only been providing Spanish instruction to those students whom we are obligated to by code. And so they've been receiving some Spanish instruction, but certainly not the amount that they would had they been in a full day dual language scenario. So because of the uniqueness of that first grade class and knowing that there are already at least 10 students involved there, we're looking at that being a single class as well. Then as we look up to our second through fifth graders, after a lot of conversation, you know, though the, the combination class of second and third grade in one classroom with one dual language teacher has its challenges, it also provides for, for flexibility and, and even opportunities for integration throughout the day that were less readily available when we really built out the schedule the way we, we built the program this year. So we'd be looking to have two combination classes, a second and third grade class and a fourth and fifth grade class, supported by one dual language teacher, also instructional assistance support, and also make making sure that we were looking for moments during the day, many of them, and, and we, we've got some great ideas around that, to ensure that we don't go back to a situation that is isolating for our dual language students. One of the major reasons we made the change going into this year was to find opportunities for integration in the whole grade level in the whole school community. And I think we, we, there's a strong commitment from the team at El Sierra to ensure that we don't lose the traction we've gained with that. Sixth grade, there are some differences in terms of curriculum overall. And so we, we really, from the beginning, once the program reached sixth grade, we didn't ever want to have a five-six combination simply because you're dealing with two different curricular resources. To, it's just a very different system. And so we're, with sixth grade, we would maintain the system we've used for our sixth graders for the past three years, which is that group of students would be enrolled in a homeroom and would receive instruction from a dual language teacher for about 50% of their core instructional day. And then our seventh and eighth grade system would not change for next year. 
The advantages are just that organization overall. Again, it, it allows us to look at the individual students, it, but that flexibility for teachers. You know, what's ended up happening at El Sierra this year in particular with trying to say we're going to pull this group out then now for Spanish instruction and bring them back, it's almost become like a middle school bell schedule where there just isn't that flexibility that we want to have in our elementary classrooms to extend some things and, and, and kind of have a little more availability for teachers to make decisions within that day. I talked about integration. Um, when we look at the instructional model, we'll keep that 50-50 allocation beginning in grade two, but in the K and one classrooms, we would be looking at the, the, the more 80-20 model, which is pretty standard across um, all allocation plans. Um, the other you know, advantage here is that all of the students in the dual language program will have consistent support throughout their day from bilingual educators. One of the challenges, we, we heard the benefits of integration from families and from students, honestly, but one of the challenges we've heard this year is there are moments when it is difficult to ask a clarifying question or, or get that extra piece of information when you don't have someone who is speaking your, your still currently dominant language in the classroom. And again, that sixth grade, um, Com configuration allows us then to have the teacher in that role spend some time with intervention and small group support for the program. That's the other thing we've heard consistently with our current programming is we do have one bilingual resource teacher who is pretty much allocated a majority of her time to that program, but that now spans seven grade levels. And so having an additional bilingual staff member who can provide support, intervention, small group work, this model was in place at Kingsley pre-pandemic and it, it worked really well. And so we're excited to bring that back to El Sierra for next year. So then when we look at two-way programming, the, the, the first goal, first and foremost, is to make sure that we are developing the strongest instructional model we can for our AL students for whom we are obligated to provide this instruction in Spanish. And so that is a few things. Again, it's, it's acknowledging that the research really is clear that this is best practice and, and, and we, we can't get there without making the shift into this program. Um, that, you know, making sure that the model doesn't isolate or segregate students based on their heritage. And we're working on that with the one-way program, but this again, builds more of that community where we have students of multiple native languages in those same classrooms, frankly, just as we do for all of our other EL students of other native languages than Spanish across the district. The other thing it does is it helps us to move away from making instructional design decisions that, that we have already moved away from in other ways. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we had a number of combination classes. That was something we did in general education as a response to class size and to try to keep class size more balanced. Instead of adding a section and dropping way down, we would add a combination and pull kids from two grade levels. And we, that instruction did work well in the past with, you know, curricular resources as they are and just reflecting on those experiences. We've moved away from those, and you don't tend to see combination classes in general education, but in order to, to make this still work, we're still working through this type of a scenario. You know, I think you know, there are other examples where we can look to how do we create best instructional models for students that require some different things. So one of the advantages for a small group, admittedly, of students is that we would have some monolingual English students who would receive the benefit of, of, of bilingual education. And that certainly is a benefit, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much smaller piece of the overall puzzle. We're not in a position demographically in District 58 where we can set a goal of saying we want to provide bilingual education for as many parents or for many as many students as parents might desire that for that simply isn't the, the structure of our community we can't provide those balanced classrooms so it really we have to start at the core of this program is about our EL students and making sure we can give them what we believe they deserve and, and we want and bring it up, you know, up to the same standards that we hold all of our other programs to so how do we do that in year one what we really want to emphasize is we are starting with a deliberately narrow focus. And so all of the things we're putting in place, we're putting in place for next year's program. That means, yes, we're only going to start with one grade level. We're going to keep two kindergartens so we can focus there. And our, our expectation is really to limit it to one classroom. Again, the, the numbers are determined by balancing the native Spanish speaking students with the native English speaking students. And so that looking at that one classroom number, we historically, our average is about 10.5 students in the dual language program in kindergarten with, you know, that are native Spanish speakers across the history of the program. The largest number ever was 16 students in the second year. Since then, we've only hit 12 once. The rest are hovering right around nine or 10. So knowing that that is our traditional number, we expect that will keep us limited to one classroom, knowing that in the future, 
things could potentially grow, but we want to be prepared for that. And, and this is a design that we've used with other specialized programs, keeping that focus narrow at first to make sure that we can review and get feedback. I think you know, one of the things that I've, I've often said about this program is when we invite families in, we're making a nine-year commitment to families about you know, providing that dual language program. And I think for this one year, we might not say that exactly in that way. While we would expect and hope for this program to continue, I think we need to acknowledge that it is new. And while I believe that we are well prepared and well poised for success, with any brand new program, we want to make sure we give ourselves room to reflect over the course of the year. So that's not, you know, that wouldn't be said to make anyone nervous that the program could change, but I think we would just need to acknowledge that we haven't done this before. Many districts have. We, have, we can learn from our neighbors. We can learn from consultants and experts and all those things. But we want the opportunity to make sure that we are doing this right and well in its first year so that we can then continue to scale it into multiple grades. So there, tying into that then, for next year, again, step one would be identifying those EL, native Spanish speaking students across the district who would be eligible for filling that side of the classroom. And I think, again, this is one of those processes where some of our experts have said, you could broaden that. You could broaden the eligibility on the Spanish-speaking side to really anyone who has heritage, even if they aren't qualified as English learners. And again, for this first year, we would be staying true to our current procedures for, for identifying the EL students. Then, once we have that number, that helps us understand how many spaces we would have in order to balance that classroom. And so, you know, people ask, well, is there a, is there a, a maximum number? Is there a specific range? And, and throughout all of the, the consulting we've done, everyone talks about balancing. And there's no one's willing to give a hard ratio, but it really, you know, generally, once you get beyond one-third to two-thirds, it, it's not really a balanced and authentic experience. And so that's kind of a, a framework for where we, we would be looking at it. So if we identified 10, um, EL Spanish speaking students, then you know maybe 14, maybe 15, but certainly not more than that. We wouldn't want to bring that size up too much higher to keep a true balance in the program. And so because of that, our recommendation at this point is to first offer those monolingual spaces to El Sierra kindergarten students for a few reasons. One, it has the potential to take some of the variables off of the table in a new year in terms of how many homeschools we might be dealing with and transportation. And again, also recognizing that limited number of space in general. The other thing to consider, which isn't necessarily the driving reason to do or not to do something, but there is the potential of offsetting FTE when you start in one school with that first offer. So a scenario could be El Sierra has 33 kindergarten students who are registered at this point. That would right now be two classes of kindergarten students based on that number. If 13 of those families were to opt into dual language, then potentially those, you know, that, that balances the dual language classroom. Now we're down to 10 kindergarten students, so that's one class of kindergarten at El Sierra, which takes that FTE increase and actually offsets it. Again, not the driving reason, but something to consider as we think about you know, managing all of, our, all of the costs associated with all of these programs. If there were not enough El Sierra families who were interested in being part of the dual language fam uh, program in kindergarten, we would then look at the number of spaces available and potentially have a full district-wide lottery. Other things to look at with kindergarten in specific, in specific, the program in dual language has always been a full day program as the way we deliver that required service to students to ensure that we're providing time for instruction in English and in Spanish to the dual language students. So our students who are eligible for services would not pay those fees because that it is the way we're delivering a, a special service to them. However, a family who was a monolingual English family if they were doing a full day program, they would be paying O'Keep next year in kindergarten. And so we would, we would assess a similar fee, or the same fee, frankly, as O'Keep to manage that as sort of an equitable scenario. So the benefit is certainly, yes, you'd have access to bilingual education, but because you would be experiencing the full day kindergarten model, which is achievable through O'Keep, that, that fee would be assessed. The other thing I've mentioned before is we may begin with a class size that's higher than our district kindergarten target. Um, we, we still want it to be a reasonable class size, but the other thing we have to remember is that there isn't a lot of entry to dual language after kindergarten. Sometimes first grade, rarely coming from another dual language program. But as I've shared in previous board meetings, the, the program is not likely to increase in size over time. It is likely to decrease slightly. And so starting with a slightly higher class size than we might typically in kindergarten, prepares us for that going forward. So then in terms of that sustainability piece, as Todd mentioned, there's three FTE over the next several years included in the financial plan. 
Some of this obviously has to do, as, as many things do, with the outcome of the referendum. In this case, it has to do with if or when sixth graders move to the middle school. So if they, if six, eight middle schools do occur at some point in the future, the overall FTE increase is about 2.0. If they do not, on the conservative side, it would be 3.0. And so we're actually, as we've looked at the configurations, we're looking at one increase for next year, and then in 24 and 25, and then potentially in 25 or 26, and I'll show you kind of how as that walks through. There's actually the potential, if six, eight middle schools happen in 25, that we could reallocate some of this FTE based on the overall structuring. Again, to be, to be sure, this assumes one classroom per grade level right now. So that's our historical enrollment data and what that looks like. So to give you an idea of how this looks, and teachers are identified by letters of the alphabet to, to make it clear that these, the teachers could literally fall in any color of the column. I don't, you know, we don't want to get an individual staff placement right now. But for next year, we'd be looking potentially at a two-way classroom. That's one teacher. Those first graders, as I mentioned, that's another teacher. Second and third together. Fourth and fifth together. And so obviously one additional teacher that we don't currently have. The sixth grade position, again, teaching those sixth grade students and providing interventions and supports, and then a teacher who provides both EL and dual language services at the middle schools would be that, that teacher F in there. And so again, this configuration, honestly, if we were to say that kindergarten remained one way for another year, or, or if the board were comfortable with moving forward with two-way, this is still the staffing configuration we believe is appropriate to support the program going into the next school year. Rolling up into the following year, we would have kindergarten and first grade potentially as two-way programs because of the way the staff is structured there would be no increased staff required to make that staffing work in the 23-24 school year in 24-25 now that that second grade program would become a two-way program we would see an additional teacher picked up in the in this model again there could be some different configuration but most conservatively we'll call it a full-time FTE to make sure that we are planning appropriately for two years out and then when we get to 25, 26, this is where that sixth grade question becomes, you know, if we're moving over, that could change some things, but we still have, we don't need anything additional at that point. We might even have some additional flexibility. And then now, as the further out we get, just like with financial projections, it's tougher to predict enrollment and things, there's more question marks. But this is the place where if we didn't have the six, eight middle schools by this point, then we would need that additional, that third FTE would come on in 26, 27, as the two-way program continues to roll up. And then again, we kind of go forward. This just brings us another year further without recognizing that at that point, we are fully staffed six, eight middle schools or seven, eight middle schools for the program in its current size. So then our next steps, obviously we would need to look for that additional dual language teacher for the program. We are looking for board approval to begin that two-way program in kindergarten next year. After that moment, or when, if that were to happen, we would obviously be developing information. We've kind of put out a save the date night, but we would need to really get information out to families, working to identify those students and continuing our work on program development. Um, again, we're, that work is happening in the background in the anticipation that hopefully we will be heading in that direction, but we're in, we're in good shape from a timeline perspective. The reality is that, you know, on the one hand, we know that kindergarten registration is happening, roundups have been happening happening. The truth is that by the time we are able to get through the screening of all of these kindergarten students and really understand those numbers and what that looks like, because the people who do the screening are teaching students all day right now, and so you know we don't necessarily pull them all out at once for that. It, it is typically mid to late May when we are finalizing those incoming kindergarten numbers for our dual language program. So this keeps us on our, our current timeline. And then obviously continuing on the, the one-way program and all of the work that needs to be done, there will be some shifts for next year. And so there's, we've already got some plans to give our dual language team some time to continue developing that, um, that program for our current dual language students. So that is the end of my presentation. Obviously, this was <laughs> designed as a discussion item, so now I will stop talking. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I encourage you to discuss, and I'm obviously happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking the time to put some slides together. I know you said this has been going on for, uh, for several years, but uh, we've been a little bit distracted from this over the last couple, so it, it is always good to get a little bit of uh, a refresher where we've been and how we got here uh, so that we can open up a conversation on that. So with that, I, I open it up to the table. Uh, we do have some potential action later on today, depending on this conversation. So I open the floor to... Any questions, either discussion amongst ourselves or questions for, for uh, either Justin or Kevin? Um, Justin, first, thanks for all of that work. That seems like 
so much work just to get to this point. Um, how do you feel, I know you mentioned timeline shortly, which is what was my big question is, how do you feel overall about timeline and do you have any general feedback from like the kindergarten roundup or anything that shows bless you, some kind of interest in this kind of a programming? I think it is a fantastic opportunity. Um, you know, financial considerations need to be made, but I think this is a great, great direction to start moving. So in terms of feedback, um, we received applause at the BPAC meeting when we said that we were making this recommendation and moving forward. So obviously that, you know, our, our, our Spanish-speaking population is excited to see the program happen. Um, when we did this sort of, the, the survey of siblings and preschool students, so not everybody registered, but we saw plenty of interest. Like I said at one of the previous meetings, the interest from um, monolingual English families drops a little bit when you say it won't be at your home school, but certainly enough interest to to believe that district-wide we will be able to find families who are excited to fill these spots. So I think in that sense, we're good. I think our, our teachers are excited and eager and have been and have been <laughs> chomping at the bit for a long time to see this, this move forward. And so from that perspective, I think, you know, when we asked the, the dual language full committee, is this the right time to do it? You know, you're always have, you always wish you had three years to plan something for sure, but I think there was also kind of a, if not now, then when? You know, we'd called this the program review year. We're at the point of recommending. We're, we're starting small and focused. And so I think, I really do believe we can we can accomplish this within the timeline we have left and, and that includes honestly it, you know the, the item tonight is potential even if there were two more weeks where we needed to, to think more and bring back more information I think as long as we can can get out of April with moving forward we're, we're ready you know, the work is already happening in the background so that we're prepared for this we're trying to balance not getting too far ahead of board approval but also being ready with thinking about what will that parent communication look like you know we have all of the curricular materials we have a teacher who's been been teaching kindergarten new language so in that sense we're, we're in a I, I'm, I feel good and I mean sure you always wish there were more there was more time but I think I feel I'm confident that we can move forward and, and be poised for success if anyone can make a short timeline work I think it's you and your teams <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's great and I, I like the idea that it's you know let's make this the pilot year for kindergarten see how it goes 22 23 school year and then based on positioning of the referendum, positioning of financial, the FTEs, where things are shifting and moving, you know, it gives an opportunity to say, okay, yes, this is a wonderful thing to be doing, or this actually isn't going to work on a long-term basis. So it's a, maybe a, a beneficial time to start doing it. A couple of questions on the, um, the fee schedule, just to clarify to make sure I'm understanding correctly. So monolingual st students will pay the same fee as if they were paying an O'Keefe. They're not paying double the fee. They're not paying for O'Keefe and then dual language on top. It's the same, just the one time. Correct. One as as okay. if they were enrolled in O'Keefe, they were gotcha. paying the job. Okay. And then also, will we be applying the same sort of standards we do for all of the programs if someone were to qualify for some sort of, um, you know, aid and financial support and things like that, they would get that as well if they were opting into this yes. program. Yeah, okay. because it is a school fee, fee waivers would apply just like they do for O'Keefe. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. I have. Uh, I, I also uh, appreciate the hard work here and uh, the thoughtfulness. Um, anytime you start something new, uh, I really like to lean towards piloting and making sure you're starting small and focused. And so I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and not trying to go big or go home, but be, do this do this right and start by under promising and over delivering. Uh, and I imagine that's part of your thought process. Uh, do you mind speaking to? Uh, on the from the administrative capacity how, how will your team lean in who, not specific names maybe but particular roles that you expect to be the vision and oversight to make sure that this pilot goes really well yeah absolutely so we you know we will be identifying an administrator who is the you know a curriculum coordinator who is focused on this program and that will be obviously a, a significant portion of that person's role um, our hope is to seek someone who is bilingual and who has some experience in, in all of these areas as well. So that is that is the current goal. If we are not able to uh, to recruit that person into a full administrative position, we've talked about other possibilities in terms of some long-term consulting or things like that. I think, you know, we, we will have someone who is dedicated to the program on our staff, and I think we want to make sure that we also have access to that expertise. If they're one and the same, that's a, that's a bonus. If they're not, then we will make sure that we have both in place going into the next school year. Thanks. I think this is extremely valuable, and you know, as uh, 
parent of two kids at El Sierra, you know, I wish this happened, you know, a few years ago. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think uh, one thing, you know, as I kind of listened to parents, you know, over the last couple of years, and I think like there's an opportunity to create more awareness as to, you know, what this program is, you know, for the people that aren't going to take advantage of it or may not be directly, their, their children may not be directly involved. So I guess, I guess it's two questions. Like, how are we going to kind of define that awareness so it's not this scary new thing, um, which I think it kind of was these past couple of years. It's like, it exists, you know, you kind of talk to your kids, you kind of get one story, you talk to their homeroom teacher, you get a different story, and, you know, you're, you're trying to separate fact from fiction. So I guess the question is, how do we kind of prevent that, you know, proactively prevent that? And then I think, you know, you answered Karat's question, like how do we kind of look at success at a, at a program level and, you know, it kind of gets to the classroom, but how do we look at success at a building level, right? So if we, you know, I, th I think this is, this is all um, great for, for El Sierra, but how do we kind of define success at the building level? So if we expand this pilot to the other buildings, what is that success criteria that we would use? Great question. So first, I can tell you that the, the BPAC members and the dual language teachers are, are so eager for more communication to come out about all of this. And my my job right now is to not announce a program that the board hasn't approved. And so as soon as we get to that point, you know, talking about the two-way program and what that will look like, that will that will be a, a broad announcement. Like we really do want to get that out there. I think you're also referencing, so yeah, that's that's the new program, but then the current programming, how do we really discuss what those structures will look like? And I think again, we'll be going into next year. So some of it can come through principal newsletters, just like we would lay out who are the teachers at each grade level. And then I think the other place where we have the ability to capture some more of that is through the the curriculum nights at the beginning of the year where we really, you know, again, we're going back to a model that we're more familiar with and so there won't be as much unknown at the beginning of the year. There will be a lot more definitive here is how this is going to work. Here's what this will look like for your student who may be in the dual language program. Here's what this will look like for your student who is not in the dual language program. Here are the moments when they might be together. Here's how specials are going to work. Here's the, you know, what the class configuration will look like across the curricular day. I think that's part of the benefit too. Last year we made, we did make some of those decisions six, seven weeks from now, and so we, we have a lot more time this year to make sure we can leave this 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 school year with a much more um, definitive plan for next year. So I, I'm, com I'm very confident in the communication pieces, particularly at El Sierra. When we talk about what will the success criteria look like, I think those are those are the kinds of questions we are we're, we are truly going to have to develop as we go forward. You know, it's not necessarily it's it's a tricky one because certainly that's going to include feedback from parents, feedback from staff. It's going to include you know what does this look like in terms of impact on an overall building. Did you know one of the things we recognize this year is it the way we configured things was stressful for the building schedule. So we're trying to to fix that again. There's a to get to success at a building level when we're starting so small. I think might. Be be a couple of years out, but I think the same way we're going to say, did this one-year program work in kindergarten? That same set of questions are questions we need to have. And, and, and candidly, I don't, I can't rattle off a list of those for you. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, we, we we can go back to surveys we've done and kind of work through that and really, you know, have something so that by this time next year, we're in a place to say, because of A through Z, we are or are not confident in moving forward. All right, no, I appreciate that. And I guess uh, I would encourage a little. You know the the balance of communication coming from um, the principal or the building level. I would say that this program, kind of where we're at, I would actually like to see more of that come from that that balance come from the, the administration. Just yeah. give you that that feedback. I I appreciate that, and I appreciate that you were one of the parents who would read something I sent. I think one of the things <laughs> we find is that sometimes the principal newsletter is a much more read communication. But we will certainly work together. On all. Okay, thank you. I think one of the other models that we're going to lean into hard in terms of communication is the model that we currently have for special education around the RISE program, the BEST program, the DLP program. We've got some very successful specialized program models going on in our, our schools and how are we finding success with the way those programs are communicated, um, the way inclusion is communicated in those programs, and, and really try and replicate that um, from a district perspective, but then also repeat it at the building level. I think we learned a lot from the feedback we got during open house this year. Uh, I, I think our LCR families were, were very direct about the communication they appreciated, and, and um, you know, we got a lot of constructive criticism about some things that we should have communicated more clear, or so people didn't feel surprised by the time they walked in at open house. And I, I think really both uh, the, the families that had students in the program and the families that were in general education just really wanted to know how is this going to work and how is this going to impact my, my student. 
and how are we confident that the teachers that are implementing it you know, really get the necessary information from us so that they can speak to it, Steve. Because one of the things that you said that really resonated with me is we need to have a consistent um, set of talking points no matter who that person is. If it's the building principal, if it's the assistant superintendent, if it's the classroom teacher, if it's the IA supporting, we all need to be on the same page. And, and I think that was very helpful feedback that we got earlier on uh, the school year, especially around open house. To piggyback on something you said, mm -hmm. um, and what you said about communicating um, the special programs we have, not only dual language, but BEST and RISE and all the other ones. I remember before being on the board, there was a workshop, a curriculum workshop, um, maybe four or five years ago, where they broke us out and you could follow around into different rooms. I think it was a <laughs> fellow. That you broke out into different rooms and uh, the teachers of those programs went through. I know that we haven't had in-person type of situations like that afforded to us, but perhaps this fall's curriculum workshop in October would be an excellent opportunity to highlight, you know, what what's happening starting in the fall of this year for if if it gets approved um, for that and the other programs. Because as somebody that didn't know about any of those things, seeing it and hearing the teachers do it was really impactful, and I remember I still remember it years later. Um, my only question are just to flush out or just state the obvious or just regurgitate it that this this plan when town was standing up here talking about the financial plan and how we can um, absorb the staff additions of the three full-time over the next couple of years it's not like we're that we're not in a position right now where if we do this we can't do something else is that correct that is that is correct with the goals that we outlined in our staffing plan the increase of 3.0 teachers to this program that's again as Justin pointed out that's the assumption of one class per grade level as we build this up this is in the budget and it wouldn't preclude us from any of those other goals um, the reason I, I, I won't say it won't preclude us from doing everything is because whenever you add three for something then obviously there could be future decisions that we have to say no to because we've already added the staff but in terms of our current operating procedures we believe that this is plenty of room in the budget and it wouldn't impact any of our current programs or, or take away anything and and based on one of the slides here from just a few minutes ago um, obviously full day kindergarten has been a topic of conversation on the board for a while now mm -hmm. so that it will not impact, it will not influence or, or derail any potential for a full day kindergarten. No, because this is only 3.0 when you look at the, the cost of full day kindergarten, that would be 1.5 million. So really the make it or break it uh, for full day kindergarten is gonna be whether or not a potential referendum gets approved by the board and then passed by the community. It, the only way that we're going to be able to entertain a conversation about full day kindergarten is if that referendum uh, passes. So dual language is a separate thing that wouldn't impact it one way or the other. Because, because of money or because correct, of Correct, because state? of money. So I want to be clear. The so I, like, yeah, could you flush that yeah, out for everybody? The potential referendum is for capital. Um, and so what, what Todd was showing in the five-year plan, if the referendum were to pass, then we would continue to dedicate a million dollars in addition every year in capital if that referendum uh, doesn't pass that's if the board approves it um, and if it doesn't pass then we would take that money that we would dedicate to full day kindergarten take that out of operations and add that to that million dollars and so you'd have 2.5 million every year that we would add into uh, that pile um, for capital so full day kindergarten would not be able to become a reality unless the community were to support a referendum where we could take that large chunk of money from that bond sale and, and uh, dedicate that to um, our buildings which would then free up some of the operations money that we can uh, then put into full day kindergarten okay thank you and mm -hmm. thank you for fleshing out the slide seeing how it goes every year that was helpful for me thank you megan just really quickly off of something tracy just said that i thought was interesting interesting um the idea of using a potential curriculum workshop down the road to highlight some of the programs you mentioned bringing in the teachers from those programs something that just might also be a good addition to that because i think oftentimes we've heard sort of anecdotally and also just through some communications that sometimes families um struggle with those programs potentially being housed in this their home schools and there's you know occasionally questions about that and why that's happening and different things it might be helpful to have 
parents of students in those programs speak to the benefits because I think sometimes knowing that there's a real family and a real student behind those programs that are affected and see positive impacts can help other families you know they can see this is a family that's just like my family and this is a student that's just like my student they just need these other things to be successful and that can help them to understand the importance and the value and so that might be a good addition to that type of model as well just for future reference um also just in general about this shift moving forward i think it's amazing i think justin you said a couple really um kind of hit the nail on the head a couple of times in in your presentation speaking towards the idea that you know there's a lot of things that were mandated or obligated to do in education to provide and those they set sort of like minimum guidelines for things you know you have to provide these minimum services to students and i think as a district we don't strive to hit those minimums we strive to go far above those minimums in all the areas that of education that we provide and i think this is just a, a perfect example of that we have a program right now that meets the minimums but it's not best practice it's not what is what studies have shown to be the best way to provide the best education possible to the students who who need and deserve these services and so if we can provide something better if we can provide a model that better meets their needs and provides them with the highest quality education possible we should do that and to me there's there it's kind of a no-brainer I think that um hitting the minimums is not our goal and so all of our special programs have been set up and have have you know we strive to to go well beyond that in every other area of education whether it's a special program or general education we never we never reach the minimum we're always going above that and we should do the same for these students they deserve it so i fully support <clears throat> Justin, I, I want to just say that this is a, a fantastic presentation. I really appreciate all the work that you put into this, and I, I, you know, thank you to you and to all the staff and families who've been participating in this. Um, uh, it's really great to hear this. I think this is this is a great idea, uh, and I and I have nothing but, but praise for your efforts. I do I do want to get that out there. I do have two major concerns that are nagging at me, and I'm not I won't be supporting this tonight. I could support this a year from now, but I won't be supporting this tonight. And I'm, I'm just want to explain why. Uh, number one is um, we are in the midst of an equity audit, and we uh, have been talking since I've been on the board, defining equity as we're providing equal opportunities, equal academic opportunities for all students. And um, I, I guess what I, you know, like what Steve said earlier is like, man, I wish my kid could have participated in this. I, I wish my kid could too, uh, but I can't because he won't be going to El Sierra next year. And um, I feel like that is. You know, I, I understand exactly why we're doing this. I think this creates a, a problem. I mean, uh, it, 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 we're solving a problem, but I think it creates other problems. And I feel like since we're, we're putting so much emphasis on equity, I feel like um, when you, when you t think about like, the, 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 the benefits that students are going to get from this, the, the, the monolingual students, when you talk about the, the academic and the, and, the, and the economic doors that are going to be opening for them because of their participation and their su successful completion of this program, um, certainly there's going to be 12 students next year who are going to um, gain tremendously from this. And that's great. And I don't, and I don't, I don't mean to rain on that parade. And I, so I, that, that's, just a, uh, that's not something that, that, that's not what's causing me to vote no. Um, I, I could support this a year from now. For me, it's, it's the conversation that Tracy and Kevin were just having about full day kindergarten. I think we've been, we've been hearing from parents for years about, um, about how we want to expand programming, when we want to offer it this, this, and this to kids. We've always said no, we've always said we don't have the resources. Um, I feel like if, you know, and Emily, you're right about like, we need to go above and beyond, not to hit the, minim hit the minimums. Um, we, we for, for seven years, we haven't, we've had this, this program where we have O'Keep, and we have um, not, we, we don't have full day kindergarten. I think our community is looking for that. Um, and and even if, if we don't pass the referendum, we don't have the ability to do that. And this isn't, you know, what Kevin and Tracy were saying, this isn't um, going to make a, this isn't going to, you know, I'm, I'm estimating like $200,000 a year for three FTEs. Um, that's not going to get us close to 1.5 million, but it, it, it's, if we, that, that referendum doesn't pass, it's going to, we have a lot of other decisions we have to make. And it's not just going to be like, we're not going to be, the status quo isn't going to be continuing on. Um, if that referendum doesn't pass, we're going to have to make a lot of really, really hard decisions. That's going to completely change the district. I, I, think we, I think we still need to be focusing on all the kindergarten. So 
I guess, I, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase this. I, I want to support this. Help me get there. And I can try to get there tonight. Because I, I, I real, your presentation was excellent. And help me understand, I mean, maybe this is a Todd and a Kevin question. Mm -hmm. I feel like we, we, we've been talking about all-day kindergarten for years, and we, we, we're, we're so close, we're not there yet. So help me understand how we can prioritize another program, another program expansion without offering what is like going above and beyond, like Emily said, the minimum expectations for all students that every single student is going to be benefiting from, and, and, and donating a significant amount of resources towards a few students that, you know, our, our data says, our families uh, from our survey said 40 to 80 percent, and how the question was phrased, would be interested in this program, but we're only going to select 12, and we're only going to select 12 who happen to go to one school. Mm -hmm. So how do, you know, help me understand how we, how we can, as an organization, make that decision um, that about about resources, allocating resources in this way, when we have this, this greater need, I don't know if it's a greater need, we have this different need that we've been talking about for years and, and not putting every ounce of energy we have towards meeting that goal we've been talking about for so long. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And I, and I appreciate um, those questions. I think they're very fair questions and I, and I think they should be asked whenever you're having uh, these conversations. I guess the way um, to look at it, and, and Justin, I'll let you jump in as well, is I draw a lot of parallels here between dual language of preschool. Now please, I, I'm not suggesting these are the same uh, programs, um, but when you start with English learners, I, I think one of the most fundamental differences between that and full day kindergarten, uh, there, there's two variables here. One, we are obligated by law to provide uh, this type of instruction um, to students who are Spanish speaking because of the numbers that we have um, in the district and then in Indian Trail and then um, you know, in El Sierra in particular. And, and so th that is, uh, you know, the, the very first reason. The, the second reason is what we're trying to do here is just like we do in preschool. So the reason the district has a preschool, or one of the most fundamental reasons we have a preschool is because um, the law requires us when students turn three to create an environment where we're meeting their needs for special education. And in order to accomplish that, um, sometimes we have standalone programs for students who have um, substantial needs at an early age, but we also have what we call a blended program, where we have special education students that need to be integrated with typical peers, and those typical peers then are added to that classroom to make sure that those students that were obligated to provide that instruction by law get the most out of their experience, and as a side benefit, those uh, general education or typical peers also benefit from that. Here, the, the goal here is not to create a dual language pathway for every child in District 58. We can't do that. We can't have a situation like some school districts, and in, in, in I don't even know any in, in DuPage County, I guess, you know, West Chicago, Addison might be close, but even they can't offer that where you register for school and you say, would you like Spanish or English? So what we do, or what we're proposing here, is that we have a unique need by law that we want to meet. We want to enhance that instruction uh, for the greatest possible outcomes, and we know dual language is the way to do that. So in order to do that, we need to blend our dual language students with typical peers in a general education setting. And so yes, we would offer that opportunity to a limited number of students, but we couldn't offer it to everyone. And so back to the equity equality thing, the way I view the equity work is how are we providing pathways for all of our students? I, I don't necessarily view equity as it, it means every kid's gonna get the same thing guaranteed. There's no way that we can ever do that in a school district. That's why you know some of our gifted students might receive more because that's what they need, or some of our intervention students might receive more because that's what they need. Um, so really what we're talking about here in our mind is how do we build a system for those Spanish learners by law that we know we have to provide that instruction for, and how do we do it to the best of our ability? And what the committee has been saying since 2018, and what the research says is that dual language is the way to go. In order to accomplish that though, you do need typical peers to be there. Now when we're looking at that, we felt it made the most sense to start small at El Sierra, build on that success rate, and then continue to evaluate that program throughout the year to see, you know, does it make more sense to keep it at El Sierra um, and only El Sierra families, or do we want to expand that across the school district? We're not there in a position where we can just start by uh, expanding it across the school district. And so that's how I would answer that. But certainly, 
do I think it is a fair point to make that, well, what about the, the kids at, you know, Bel Air or, you know, Hillcrest that might not have the same opportunity? And, that, and that's fair. But I would also, you know, argue that we have some of those things going on in our school district right now. Preschool is a great example yeah. to me, and, and I think we've got a successful model. Um, it's not an apples to apples comparison, preschool to dual language, because um, for, for a variety of reasons. but. I do feel like we've got successful models every school district has in this particular sense. And some of the other districts like uh, Naperville 203 or Glen Ellen 41 or West Chicago School District that has these programs, they're modeling it in a similar uh, fashion. When they started, they started in a very similar way. And so, well, go ahead, Justin. No, I, and you mentioned like 203 and 41 are other examples of districts that do the same thing in terms of initial enrollment. They begin with, they actually begin with siblings, most of them, then they begin with students in the attendance area. 203 only has one school that accepts dual language students, monolingual students outside of that attendance area, and 41 is lottery, is the same thing we're proposing, lottery if it's not full there. The only thing I'd add to what Kevin was saying is, Yes, there are. There could be some significant decisions that would have to be made in the not so distant future if a referendum were to be voted on by the board and then accepted by the community. And I think that's part of the reason that we are viewing this as a. We we are going to start now, but we are not going to make that necessarily nine-year commitment to all of the students in this program just yet. And I think that can be for a couple of reasons. One is program development, but the other is to recognize that you know what we're asking for next year in staffing is is the same. Honestly, we're not investing anything more to begin a two-way program next year than we would be if we delayed a two-way program. The first investment to keep a two-way program going is actually a couple of years from now. And so, if we found a point where we had to say we want to think about reinvesting any funds like that until we can accomplish another goal, there would be room for that conversation at the administrative and the board level. So I think you might have answered my question I was about to ask, but maybe you can just add a little more color to it. Um, what Potentially, what is what are you asking the board to approve tonight? So what we're, what we're, what we're asking the board to approve is the beginning of a two-way program for kindergarten students next school year. So the, the, the potential action that would take place tonight is for the pilot for next year, and then nine yeah. to twelve months from now, we're going to have a, a different. We're going to have a. You're going to obviously analyze the success of the program, come back with a proposal for year two, which would be. Um, we would be having a similar conversation here. Yes, I, we. I have not. We haven't used the word pilot in in the official, but sure. but in, conceptually, yes. Melissa used it earlier. Yeah, sorry. We we are no, but that's okay. I mean, I think there. I like you to know, name your programs, Justin. <laughs> so I think you know. I think I think that that's the reality. Is we do we do want to acknowledge that this is brand new, and we have to have room to come back and have a conversation. My hope is that it's a really easy conversation, and it's a one meeting conversation in in about a year from now. But but we have to be ready for we whatever the reality is. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know to to round out. The difference between full day kindergarten is full day kindergarten is not required by law. EL instruction is in the scale of full day kindergarten. You hit the nail right on your head, Greg, with the dollar amounts when you're talking three FTE versus a $1.5 million program. Um, dual language, one way or the other, is not going to impact whether or not we're going to be able to offer full day kindergarten because in order to offer full day kindergarten you have to have at least to start off a million and a half dollars in perpetuity in your budget in order to do that where dual language doesn't require that same uh, level of commitment in terms of dollars in perpetuity. Um, it, it's a slow build up to that but you're, you're talking about three FTE which is uh, you know, a different ask than full day uh, kindergarten. Uh, again, I support full day kindergarten. It's something that I would love to see uh, become a reality. However, these two are, are, are different for me in, in the dollar sense and then in the legal sense of, of where we're at as it, it, a school district. Okay. One of the things that I, I wrestled with a lot of the same questions you did, Greg, and I had a chance to talk with Justin earlier today. Um, but we, we made a choice as, as a Downers Grove Great School District community to have neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. If we had greater level centers, this would be a lot easier of a absolutely uh, of a program. Yeah, and that's what I was kind of getting. But, but we've chosen not to do that. And we, I mean, I ask a lot of my uh, you know friends in my community of like, should we move to greater level centers? And the you know I can't even get the sentence out before somebody says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that is a choice. Uh, so a lot of communities in our area choose to do it differently, right? Marker School District 60, neighboring us in Westmont, has a K through two center, a six, three through five, and a six through eight. They have uh, 11 sections of kindergarten, all in one building. 
which allows the student that's an EL student that attends Highland or an EL student that attends Bel Air or an EL student that attends, uh, attends um, Leicester or, or, or Fairmount, they can be, they can choose to sign up for this, the, the dual language program that they're launching this coming year um, without having to change the school that they go to. Uh, but we made a choice, and so in those in those situations, these are the trade-offs that end up coming our way, um, and it puts us in an unenviable and also an enviable position, depending on what side of the coin you're on on that decision. Uh, but I wrestled with it, and I still landed on the side of supporting this program because it made sense for the students that we're intending to impact. And, and just to piggyback off of that, from an administrative, we wrestled with those same things. I think the lens that I have and, and our, our team has with this is. You know, it, it would be a much different conversation if we were talking about offering a dual language experience for every single child in District 58. That's not what we're, we're talking about here. What we're talking about is not only meeting our um, requirement under the law, but enhancing it to the greatest extent possible for those students who qualify mm -hmm. for this particular uh, dual language um, program, and then blending in typical peers who will also benefit but certainly, I want to be very clear with the board and very clear with the community. This is not an opportunity for every single child in District 58. I, we just have to be very, very upfront. At best, it would be a lottery system. But when you're only pairing that with one grade level section, uh, you know, into the future, you're not talking about a large number of typical peers that would get that blended experience. Yeah, and I, th I think what I've seen in some other districts that have um, multiple schools and they have a similar dual language program is that over time, mm -hmm. it's been expanded to an, uh, one other school or two other, you know, we don't know what the future state of this may be, but, you know, the only way to move forward and offer more opportunities across the board is to move forward for the first time. And to give a, a one-year quote unquote pilot, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, would, would give us the lens to say, is this working, is this not working? And I would encourage that we have this conversation earlier than now next year, that we maybe approach it, you know, mid-year and then mid-school year and then maybe earlier on February um, prior to registration starting again to see, okay, what are the families who are involved in this? How are they feeling about it? What's our district as a whole looking at this program as? Um, what does our community think as an entirety? Anything else? Good discussion. Yeah, you and, and, and I kind of sat back and listened here because you and I have had, I mean, several conversations on this and obviously um, and, and even putting this uh, meeting together. So I, I really do appreciate it. And um, one of the other things I, I think I want to say on this that I don't think has, has been addressed, um, and it has nothing to do with, with starting it as a, a two-way program right now, this is a program that we all know has been here and, and it's been about, but I don't know that we as a board, at least from my term sitting on here, has had much conversation about it. And in this process, I think has required me to do a little bit deeper dive. Um, and I think we gotta continue to look at the balance of the benefits and potentially some of the challenges of this program in general. I know that there are advantages to doing this K all the way through eight, for example. And uh, in that it puts them on a track, you know, to, to be certified, you know, bilingual and stuff as they go through high school. I also look at those diminishing numbers, and I, as I think to where we were during COVID, um, in the point where we had cohorted our kids in, in middle school, and some of the pushback that we got, we were cohorted for, you know, the full year and how difficult that was. I, I do get nervous as I see that cohort get smaller and smaller and smaller that they're not necessarily getting the experience that I would like everyone to have in K through six. Now that helps a little bit if six moves in into the middle school and the experience and the way that we set it up in middle school. But I think that now that we've dived into this, I'd like to continue to hear more as this goes on. And does that become more successful in a, in a stronger program as we get up into fourth and fifth and sixth grade? Uh, in, you know, years in the future when you have a little bit more balance in, in bigger classes. But in the conversation that you and I had, we talked about the strength of where these students are by like fourth grade 
and really where you know they're not necessarily at the same level of need. You know, they're, they're just as strong in, in their English profic proficiency and math proficiency as our, our students not in this program. So I would just love to, you know, to watch that trajectory and then potentially have future conversations on um, sort of the best match you know, for our older kids and if they're getting those experiences that they need. I think that's the only challenge I see when you have a district that we're big enough that we need to have a program like this, but small that it's this single classroom um, and, it, and it feels a little bit disconnected. I, I think that's a challenge for me. Um, some of the stuff that Greg and I, Greg mentioned earlier, you and I have had the same conversation about. Uh, and this is obviously a very limited opportunity. I'm sure a lot of parents would like to have it, but if we have to balance and match it to only 10 uh, Spanish speaking, native Spanish speaking students, it, it becomes much more, more of a challenge. Um, with that said, I, I, I have a potential item on the board. Is there anything that, this is something if we're gonna move forward and it has to get taken care of this month. I'm happy to have the action on tonight's meeting unless there is additional information we do have a second meeting this month if we needed to send uh, Justin or Kevin back uh, to provide us with additional information prior to taking action I think you brilliantly answered everything we asked last go around so thank you okay. all right well thank you then appreciate it thank you all right Thanks. now that brings me to public comment <laughs> we don't have a big population here tonight, but I'll read through it anyway. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff. I have a lot of 30 minutes tonight, but I don't believe we have any cards. Mm -hmm. All right. So then um, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to our action items for tonight. The first one is approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the March 14th, 2022 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the March 14th, 2022 regular meeting as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and the summary? So move. Second. All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have some recommendations here. The first one is the 2021-2022 amended school calendar. Is there a motion to approve the 2021 through 2022 amended school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? This one will uh, not have school end on a Monday and will end on a Wednesday. So <laughs> that's a success. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Snow. We told you it would probably no, work out that way. Data, <laughs> Trace, Tracy knows that if school ever end, ends on a Monday, she's very frustrated. So. Yeah, thank right. you for reminding me. Yeah. <laughs> and just to add one thing, and for our middle school families, I, I know the communication has gone out. Promotion will be that Tuesday evening uh, at Downers Grove North High School. Uh, we will do a meal at 5 and hair at 7, uh, just like we always have. And so that will be at DGN, and there will be more information coming out. Anybody this is, I, I, it's kind of related to that. Are we talking about snow days? At, yeah, that's a great time? question. We are going to talk about snow days in the summer. Um, so that'll be a, a discussion topic at Thank either the June like or July. I would like to address We that. have not forgot about that. We Thank are going to put that in the summer okay. uh, conversation. Thank you. Think about snow yeah. yeah. E-learning. <laughs> Sorry, when it's like 99. Yes. Perfect. No, but we have not forgotten about that. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. okay. Anything else? All right, let's please go roll. Um, do we need to have this on? Now? This is actually a roll call, I mean a okay. voice vote. All right, then all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the 2021 through 2022 amended school calendar as presented. Next up is the Rexner property tax abatement. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing the property tax abatement for the Rexner facility for the 2021 tax year? I, I mean. 
so moved. <laughs> Second. Second. <laughs> Getting a little out of yourself. <laughs> yeah. uh, any discussion really on this? <laughs> no? All right, let's, let's go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution authorizing property tax abatement for the Rexnard facility for the 2021 tax year. Uh, next up, we have the uh, ratification of the current COVID mitigations. Is there a motion to, one, affirm the COVID mitigations that are currently in place at District 58, two, affirm the superintendent's recommendation to return to pre-pandemic lunch protocols in alignment with the layered approach for removal of mitigations per the CDC, and three, authorize the superintendent to make further adjustments to COVID mitigation mem uh, measures as necessary based on local conditions, and four, rescind the board resolution of February 10th, 2022, to the extent inconsistent with this motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carried to one, affirm the COVID mitigations that are currently in place in District 58. Two, to affirm the superintendent's recommendation to return to pre-pandemic lunch protocols in alignment with the layered approach for removal of mitigations per the CDC. Three, to authorize the superintendent to make further adjustments to the COVID mitigations as necessary based on local conditions. And four, rescind the board resolution uh, five, uh, February 10th, 2022, to the extent it is inconsistent with the motion. All right, next up is the action on the two-way dual language program. Is there a motion to approve the initiation of a two-way dual language program for the incoming kindergarten students in the 2022 through 2023 school year? So moved. Second. All right, any further discussion on this? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried uh, to approve the initiation of a two-way dual language programming uh, for incoming kindergarten students in the 2022 through 2023 school year. We have the adoption of new curriculum. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of My World Interactive Illinois, published by Savas, in quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of 329000 $24.48. This is the new K through 5 social studies resource. So, so much. Second. <laughs> All right. Any discussion on this? Thank you so much. I'm so happy yeah. that this closes the loop because I sat on the curriculum council where the social studies teachers gave their place in line for math. So this, what this is like sweet. What those social <laughs> teachers do. They're <laughs> so, giving those social here, teachers. Yes. So um, I'm so happy about this, and I, I, one fifth grader told me it was the best thing ever. He loves it, so oh. I'd say that we're winning already, and we haven't even voted on it yet. It's a great endorsement. Yes. Fifth grader. Yep. It's what the humanities do, right? They step yep. aside. So it was time for this one. I served on the last committee when I was a teacher, so <laughs> it, it was time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for persevering. Very Any other comments or questions? <laughs> discussion at all? All right, Melissa, please go. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of My World Interactive Illinois by Savas and the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $329,024.48. We have a resolution for the honorable dismissal of teachers. Wait a minute. Sorry. No. No. Nope. 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 No. It just has the wrong thing. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> James, like, oh. I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> really? She's <laughs> reading a lot of emails. Yeah, she's panicking. A lot of emails. I, I was reading that out loud as I'm going through the kitchen. Right. You've all passed. Thank you for paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sure. Is there a motion to accept a $99,000 anonymous donation for playground improvements at Pierce Downer School? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Just a thank you to the anonymous donor. If you're listening, we really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah same. Thank, thank you. you to the anonymous donor. Pierce Downer is my school, and I think it's going to be a great thing. So really impressed. Thank you. All right. Melissa, please go. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to accept a $99,000 anonymous donation for playground improvements at Pierce Downer School. 
All right, we have a second consent agenda tonight. This is our bids consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? Uh, the painting, I guess, because I had a miscellaneous question there. So if we can do that one separately. Sure. All right. Then is there a motion to, I think we just have two bids, so I'll just do them yeah. all separate, yes, separate bids. Is there a motion to approve the bid for the Pierce Downer Playground Improvements Phase 1 as presented in the uh, packet? So move. Second. All right. Um, that is still part of the consent agenda since it wasn't considered separately. So no discussion on that. Just uh, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the consent agenda consisting of just one bid. And then now we have one considered separately that is the bid for the miscellaneous painting at various schools is there a motion to approve that so moved second all right only question i have here there's a there's a bid on here that's 4x all the others and <laughs> yeah. i'm wondering what they saw that was different than the bid that we're going to be approving oh, i was yeah. going to point to kevin to come up and talk about this and then i went and pulled up reminded we don't we don't know okay uh, yeah we don't know all right that's all i need thanks Maybe use the small brushes. I will say the, the other two brushes. are more in line with what we <laughs> previously received. And, and, like and, um, so, again, sometimes we do get an outlier. And, yeah. and uh, I get more concerned when the outliers are actually on the lower end because you're wondering, did they truly understand the scope? But these first two bids are, are similar. They're not the same, obviously, but um, are more in line with what we yep. typically see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the bid for the miscellaneous painting at various schools as defined in the consent agenda. All right, a couple of announcements, some dates. Uh, April 25th at 7 p.m. will be a special board meeting and financial workshop that will take place at O'Neill Middle School, and then we'll be back here on Monday, May 9th at 7 p.m. for our regular uh, board meeting here at Village Hall. All right, we do not have any closed uh, items tonight. However, we do have closed minutes from last month. Would anyone like to move into closed session to discuss those closed uh, minutes prior to us taking action and approving them? Absolutely. Yep. You asked if we would like to. If you'd like to go into closed. To oh, no. we need to go into closed, no. No, no. <laughs> no. 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 Oh, okay. I, I was like, I'm like, what are you talking, talking about? about? <laughs> 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 talking about judgment. All right. You possibly... All right, so we do have meeting, uh, meeting minutes from the March 14th, 2022 closed session that we'll be taking action on. So if no one has any discussion items, we have no need to go into close. Are we comfortable with yep. that? That's correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very, very. Gucci. Thank you. you. Check your All right. So then we have one item up tonight, uh, the approval of the March 14th, 2022 closed session minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the March 14th, 2022 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of its contents? So moved. Second. All right. Um, all those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The motion carried. I move to close the meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? All right. I have that. Is there second. a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Sure. Sure. <laughs> all right. The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned here at 9.08 p.m.